you can join in and we'll just go ahead and introduce everyone first and I'll let the um, participants kind of explain their own background and projects and things like that. So right now we have Dr. Dwayne McKenna who is in the screen right up here or at least on mine and <laughs> He is a William Hill Professor of Biology at the University of Memphis, Department of Biological Services. He's also the founding director of the U of M Center for Biodiversity Research and the co-director of the Agriculture and Food Technologies Research Cluster at the U of M FedEx Institute of Technology. And then on the other side of the screen at the top, we also have Kat Oglecki, who's an artist from the University of Memphis and a participant of the Art Bio Residency Program in Puerto Rico and Dynacon in Gamboa, Panama. And so both of them today are going to be talking about their work. And we have an artist who works with biology and we have a biologist. And they're going to kind of talk about how their two fields can overlap and their different interests and things of related to our uh, current show, which is in 765. And it's about environmentalism and art. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over first to um, Duane. And you can just go ahead and talk a little bit about what you do, what your interests are, um, all that kind of thing. So. OK, thank you, Madison. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Um, glad to be here with you today and always very happy to share with people about uh, just generally the topic of biodiversity. And so with that in mind, I'm not going to bore you with any of the real um, sort of nitty gritty science. And, and I say that in the sense that there's a lot of cool things to talk about and I could spend a lot of time about that. Um, but I really think what's most relevant here is to share that, you know, the natural world around us is inherently beautiful. It's an extraordinary and wonderful uh, sort of experience to be able to study it. And of course, that's what I do. And much of what I do is to both discover diversity, describe it, where it occurs, what it looks like, how it functions, um, and to share that with other people. So a very important part of what I do is to convey what I've learned and the appreciation that I have for life around us with everyone else, uh, with, with others that have an interest, with others who maybe um, had no uh, appreciation for certain aspects of it, if only because they'd never heard about it, seen about it, uh, or otherwise. So I count myself very fortunate. I'm a specialist on insects, primarily insects that interact with plants, but the cool thing about that is that insects are the most diverse macroscopic organisms. So what I mean is outside of bacteria, fungi, and some of the other microorganisms, insects are the most diverse, and if you will, most successful radiation of life on the planet. So for someone like myself who is interested in the diversity of life, who's fascinated with life and understanding how it works, uh, insects are a really natural place to study. The other part of it, of course, is that uh, plants are pretty apparent. You know, wherever we travel outside of a city, let's say, uh, plants are often how we interpret the world around us. Are we in or near a forest, an agricultural field, a grassland, or something that looks a little bit like those? So plants are extraordinarily apparent and diverse themselves, and insects, which are extraordinarily varied, interact in remarkable and varied ways with plants. So studying those two organisms, those two groups of organisms, I have this really remarkable window into the diversity of life on the planet. And before I, I move on to uh, Kat, let me just say that at different levels, I study it in different ways. So there's a part of me that um, is very much invested in studying organisms outside, in the field, in forests and prairies and all over the world for that matter. Uh, at the same time, I study their genomes, the genes that are encoded in the DNA of organisms, which are what allows them to do the myriad things that they do. Not all organisms are the same, of course, and it's the information encoded in their DNA which allows them to do the very interesting and sometimes very specialized things that they do. So with that, um, I think we'll move on to Kat, let her tell you a little bit about what she does and perhaps dig a little bit more deeply into some of this through our conversation and some of the questions. So hi, uh, I am Kat Blicky. I am a recent graduate 
the University of Memphis in the Fine Arts Department. Um, as of right now, my work is focusing on microphotography and conveying that even things that may not look beautiful when you first see them are actually extremely intricate, complicated, and beautiful up close so that even the most basic things like moss, moss are just very beautiful and valuable to our ecosystems. Um, as of right now, this series of micro images is focusing specifically on the old growth forest in Memphis and the history there and why a, a green space like this is so valuable to our community. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I got. <laughs> Madison? All right, so we're gonna go ahead and move on to the part where y'all can just kind of talk about your two interests together. And while that's going on for the participant or for the audience, if anyone has any sort of question that they wanna ask, something that pops up, you can just go ahead and put it in the chat, and then whenever they're done talking, we can ask those questions if anyone has any. Um, so yeah, we're just gonna we'll just start, and I know y'all prepared some questions beforehand. So if y'all would just like to start diving into those and kind of get to talk a little bit more specific about your interests and projects that you have going on right now. Cool. Yeah, sure. I'll go ahead and start. And, and let me just re reiterate what Madison said. I know some, real, some of the names I see on the screen are familiar, and that's great. Um, I would encourage anyone here who wants to ask a question at any level about any of this to please do that. Um, and there is an opportunity in this to be able to talk about things that, frankly, we often don't get a chance to. Um, and so I think I'll begin with a, a question for uh, Kat, and knowing that she's an artist and uh, we've talked outside of this uh, setting as well. Um, through my involvement in the Center for Biodiversity Research, Kat, by way of her interests in art, um, has interacted a little bit with us and with our faculty. And uh, one of the cool opportunities that we as a faculty saw in her interest and background was the opportunity to convey information in slightly different ways than we're used to about the life that we're studying. And, and I say we in the sense of all these faculty that I work with who have shared interests in different kinds of life. So Kat, um, my first question for you then relates to, you know, the, the sort of idea that life is beautiful. It really is in a lot of amazing ways. So in what ways can artists then um, help biologists or scientists in general anyway, um, bring this beauty to the general public? Because I have to admit that's not something that's often on my mind when I'm thinking about how to convey my science to people. So in your experience, how can we do that or do it even better? So... I think something that comes with uh, the artistic background is this knowledge of composition and color and how to present images in a way uh, to draw people in and to have their eyes travel across the image in a very specific way based on light, shadow, color, composition, all of those things. Um, so I think artists have a very interesting part in that kind of conversation. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it's, it's something that we can all really, as an artistic community, participate in. Uh, um, to <laughs> well, let me, let, let me interject sort of a, 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 some direction to that. So I think one of the really amazing things about being alive right now is the reality that life is changing rapidly before us and it's going to continue to change that way under a business as usual scenario. So I see a lot of urgency as a scientist to convey the information that I learn, the things that I gain through the science that I do to the general public. And I think one of the important ways I can do that is to just help them simply appreciate the variety, the, the, the sort of extraordinary and striking variety of life. So it takes on an urgency that it didn't before. And I, and I can appreciate, you know, um, as a scientist, I can appreciate art just for sake of art. But I also can see some other pretty important reasons to convey this sort of uh, variety and variation, which some of us would say is itself beautiful. So 
the question in that is this. Um, you were talking about, as an artist, how it is that you can convey information, and, and I, I think that's all valuable and important. Um, to what extent do you think artists that are interested in life, that are interested in biodiversity, can play a role in actually conveying these important messages, urgency, if you will, about the ways that it's changing? Um, in, in many cases, these changes are permanent. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's something that a lot of artists including myself, are actively doing at this point um, in a lot of very different ways. You have artists like Alexis Rockman, for example, whose art is very grim, but also very, very packed with all kinds of information and being incredibly overwhelming, which in a way this situation is fairly overwhelming. Um, there's a lot of artists using their skills to document uh, the changes that are happening, especially when it comes to things like climate change. Um, artists such as uh, Zarya Foreman um, and people like Sue Ko who are focused more on an activism uh, platform rather than uh, more of an ecological platform. Um, there is a way to, uh, as artists, to portray this level of urgency while also showing these things are beautiful, these things are worth saving. Uh, even if they are more of a natural thing that you may not see every day, they are still very much a valuable resource for us. So you just touched on something that I think is an important theme at the moment in science, and that is uh, the transition from advocacy to activism. And activism is kind of a loaded word, of course. It has, um, there are some meanings that I'm not referring to at the moment. And what I mean is that as people who gather knowledge, and, and I'm very fortunate to have a lot of time and energy to be able to invest in that, because that's my work, I'm also in the position then to share that with other people. And traditionally, scientists have done just that. They've shared it, sometimes even in pretty traditional ways alone, just by publication and maybe in the classroom. But that pretty clearly isn't enough. I mean, I mean, what we see happening in the world today is, I think, indicative of the reality that what we've done is not enough. There's other forces at play, but simply put, I think that we can do a better job. And I think it comes down to really thinking about that transition from advocacy to activism, which in this context I would describe as being much more active in seeking out opportunities to share information and not just share it, but suggest how to act on that information. And so, you know, that's not always easy. It requires, you know, sometimes doing things that scientists aren't very comfortable doing. So the reason I shared that and just sort of went along that little line for a moment is to ask you if you see art um, having some parallels, maybe more traditionally, that's something art has been better at doing than science. Um, but maybe if you would just wax philosophical a bit on that. Um, I think... <clears throat> You know, it, it's definitely something uh, artists have done in many different aspects of activism, not necessarily just the environmental activism, but in other areas as well. Um, taking art out of the institution and moving it to the streets and to the public, um, which is something that I am extremely interested in because I think having your work reach as many people as possible in the most public way that you can is the best way to spread that kind of people that might not ever really interact with it in their normal life. Um, just trying to get involved in a local community and share this information, maybe even taking the art out of the traditional painting and sculpture uh, is another thing that I have found to be very impactful. Uh, within the last year, I moved into more installation-based work, uh, making art that is more an experience has a way of, if somebody does not necessarily have the language uh, to look at a painting and take the, the activism-based message from that, then 
doing something in a more uh, installation format where, you know, maybe the whole room becomes the art piece. Uh, something showing images from news or documentaries or anything like that that envelops someone and turns the art into more of an experience, I think, is something that is very helpful in, in that sense. I'm just going to interject real quick. We just got a question in the chat that deals with what you're just talking about. And it's for you, Kat. And it's saying, have you ever used street art in the city of Memphis to reach people about biodiversity? I have not actually uh, had the opportunity to do that yet, but I'm very, very interested in pursuing something like that. Um, any kind of mural work or anything like that is something that I'm definitely looking into right now. You know, I find it remarkable that a large fraction of students that I see in the classroom at all levels, I mean, that includes when I have young people in the college setting who are visiting, for example, um, a large fraction, a bigger fraction at least than I would have ever imagined, have very, very little experience with the natural world. They just haven't had occasion to travel extensively outside of Memphis or for that matter, to visit natural areas within it. So I certainly see a lot of opportunity for even just bringing nature to people, young people maybe in particular, uh, by way of, of art. Um, the other thing I think that's just a relevant observation here that I'd like to hear your thoughts on, Kat, is the reality that most of life on this planet that has been documented in museums has never been written about, doesn't have names, um, has never been formally described. And so there's this extraordinary variety out there that at some level, we really don't know anything about. And sadly, most of it will be lost, frankly, before we get around to describing it. And so what, what I'm sharing, I guess, is the opportunity often to, by way of art, uh, appreciate some of this variety, even though we don't have any scientific information behind it. Some examples include there's a really extraordinary macro photography of lots of museum collection-based specimens. You can go to museums and see that their holdings have often been at least in part digitized. And again, I think it's important to, to share with people that those images are all we know of those organisms, that or, the specimen and those images. And so the variety that's present in those organisms is documented by those images and specimens. And again, uh, sort of business as usual, most of those will disappear over the coming decades. That's just the simple reality of where we're at at the moment. And that's all we'll be left with. And so appreciation for that beauty and that variety will be limited to the specimen if it remains in a museum and they don't persist forever. We've had in the last three years even two massive uh, national museums burned to the ground uh, almost, almost entirely, not entirely, but thousands or in some cases millions of specimens lost. So Kat, again, a little bit of a diatribe here. Um, what are your thoughts though on the role, again, that art can play in helping us to document some of that variety, even if only to appreciate it uh, before it's gone? Yeah, I think artists have a huge ability to do like that. Um, it's just field drawings and, you know, there's this whole area of art, uh, plein air painting, taking your materials outside uh, whether that be oil paint, watercolor, any kind of materials that you have, uh, and flipping that to where it is focusing on these specimens and documenting the things in their, you know, these creatures in their natural habitats, I think is something that uh, personally I'm incredibly interested in. That is kind of where I'm driving my career at the moment. <laughs> yeah. I think as an artist, I feel personally, I have a lot of responsibility to do something like that, especially in the time that we are in where, like you said, you know, these, we, we don't have a set time that knowing that these things, they might not be here in five years or 20 years. Uh, and you know, there is a level of responsibility that comes from that of, I need to do whatever I can as an artist uh, to document what I see uh, whether that be traveling or in my local environment and sharing that and making sure others are aware that, you know, these things 
are out there. They do exist and they are worth celebrating and learning about. I find it interesting that a number of different pieces from the past that were created just simply for the uh, landscapes that, that were depicted or the people that were painted or drawn, um, the backgrounds that are in those photos or excuse me, those drawings and paintings going back centuries are often the only documentation we have of what places once looked like. So again, you know, these often are biodiverse, remarkable, interesting places. And whether the artists at the time appreciated what they were doing or not, uh, they still play a very important role in us understanding today how those landscapes once functioned. Mm -hmm. That's kind of neat, I, I think. I mean, I even see it in, in writing, of course, as well, uh, where it wasn't intended that they would describe, let's say, the prairies of the upper Midwest and be our only real vestige of what they looked like in, in history. Um, it was really about something else. But, but again, those literary works are, are remarkably important. So cool stuff. Um, are there other questions? In fact, not even necessarily in the chat, but um, other questions from the group that's with us? If not, Kat and I have plenty of other um, things we've shared. We did share, as Madison mentioned, questions ahead of time just to kind of keep some conversation rolling here on the topic. Um, and so, Kat, is there any questions you'd like to ask me on the basis of things we corresponded about? Yeah, definitely. Um, one of my first questions is, uh, so you study insects, and I am curious about what makes insects such an important factor in this whole climate change conversation? Yeah, sure. Well, lots of reasons why. I mean, uh, on one hand, they're fundamental to the way that nature works. So they are important pollinators, far more important than we ever appreciate because a lot of what they're doing occurs way up in treetops or at a scale where it's very, very small. Uh, so extraordinarily important as pollinators, something you've heard about in the context of bees probably, but not so much other organisms. For example, I study beetles and I would argue that beetles are more important pollinators than are bees and their relatives even. Uh, they're also very, very old and in that sense they've interacted with the rest of life for a really long time. So there's other ways that they are critical to the way that nature functions that we don't always really appreciate. So that includes things like nutrient cycling. Uh, if you were to sterilize, if you will, removing all life but the plant matter in a given area of forest, you'd find that over time uh, an extraordinary density of leaves and down trees and branches and things come to clutter the forest floor and make it into something which looks very much unlike uh, what we see in most forests today. And that's because that lack of insects and certain other organisms, but certainly insects, um, is causing things like woody debris to build up that never did, to uh, increase the propensity for fire, uh, to decrease nutrient cycling and, and, if you will, capabilities of those soils and those ecosystems to provide other ecosystem services. And ecosystem services are the kinds of things that we benefit from. So that's clean air, clean water, uh, soils used for growing uh, agricultural crops. Uh, it might be other uh, services that uh, individuals use forests or grasslands or uh, nat nat other natural areas for. So they're fundamental, they're important. They've been around on land as long as plants have been. So really what happened is insects and plants came onto land at about the same time. And as a consequence, pretty much everything that they do is at some level codependent. And so we, again, don't really fully appreciate all those things, or maybe better put, we know about a lot of these things. They're documented in the scientific literature. There's people out there that know about this, but we don't function collectively, either as, in, as, as sort of communities or economies, in ways that appreciate those functions and the ways in which they provide value to us. It could be environmental quality, it could be economic contributions and so on. That's very, very slowly changing, but we still take all of those ecosystem services for granted. We really do. We don't pay for them for the most part when we go to the store. Uh, that's why we pay not much more for apples flown in from New Zealand as you might from apples grown down the street, as an example. So there's a lot more to it that we need to start to build into uh, how we act and how we uh, interact with nature. Uh, 
All right. So I'm going to ask you a question, Kat. Um, and so some of this we've touched on just a little bit, but, you know, science is often very regimented and rigid. Is there anything that you think science can learn from art about how it is that we convey information? That's a good question. Because <laughs> um, I do have you know, experience in science classes. Uh, before I was an art major, I studied marine biology at a different university. Um, and I definitely think that there is something that scientists can learn from artists. If there's one thing I've learned in my art program, it's that there's always a different way to convey your information. There's always something, whether it's medium or composition, there's always a way that you can change it and make it better to get the idea that you are trying to convey as clearly as possible. Um, specifically, I guess, <laughs> I always just want to say, like, just let it loosen up a little bit, because <laughs> I feel like uh, from my experience, science, it feels very, very tight. Um, just starting to get outside the box a little bit and think, you know, how can I express what I'm saying in a way that, you know, maybe somebody that doesn't necessarily have that kind of experience would be able to receive that information if that makes sense. Yeah, it absolutely does. I think one time, one thing I often feel constrained by as a scientist in conversation with, let's say even the general public and, and even in a situation like this, is you know science is so focused on fact and, and on information, numbers and statistics, that oftentimes we fail to share messages because we can't put our finger on the details. And I think a great example of that is this concept of a shifting baseline, which is the idea that the world has changed so much in our short frame of reference, our lives, doesn't provide us with a real good frame of reference for seeing how it's changed, because it's changed over a time scale longer than our own. So what I mean by that is we can talk to the things we've seen or studied, but we have a really hard time putting numbers on the past, and so we tend not to talk about it. I think what we lose by that is an appreciation for how extraordinarily rich, in this context, talking about biodiversity, how extraordinarily rich, extraordinarily rich life had been in the past. And I don't even just mean species lost. I mean numbers of individuals in amazing places. I mean, I'm sitting here in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, today, as far as large mammals are concerned, we have deer and not a whole lot else. Uh, we really don't. I mean, we have small canids, foxes, and coyote, but not terribly long ago, but before my experience and before my grandparents' experience, not, not only were there cougar mountain lion, whatever you want to call them here, jaguar wandered up into Tennessee. There were elk, there were buffalo, and there weren't just one or two elk or buffalo. I mean, there were pretty extraordinary herds. And if we go back further to before times when Native Americans or trapping, uh, trapping uh, was a big part of the history of our state, you go back before that, and there was extraordinary in other organisms here. And even those I mentioned were more numerous, probably. But we don't really have all the numbers. We can't really talk in great sort of detail about this. So I think we often fail to. And in not talking about it, I think we fail to appreciate what's already been lost. And so, you know, I, I think that's an interesting thing that often is a failure of science in conversation because we use as reference the recent past, which, yeah, it's changed. But if we really had some numbers and some, let's say, even just generalities about what it once really was, it was extraordinary. And, uh, you know, you can talk about biodiversity in that way everywhere on this planet, uh, sadly. I mean, but, but practically speaking, uh, that's really been the story of life in the vast majority of this earth. 
I've seen lots of amazing places, uh, places which feel extraordinarily wild, and you get to really know them and you come to appreciate that they've changed a lot. But you can't put numbers on that change other than to say certain things aren't here, certain things aren't acting the way they used to, um, and it's changed a lot. Scientists find those kind of terms pretty unsatisfying and we rarely share them. So. Okay, All right. a couple questions that have been asked in the chat, if y'all want to go ahead and answer those. Yeah, sure. Um, so to Kat is the first one, and it was, what is your favorite art medium to use, and do you feel that one medium conveys your environmentalism message better than another? Well, I am... I, I personally identify as a mixed media artist, so I do not necessarily tie myself down to one medium or another. Typically, I am a drawer or a painter, but um, I, I found changing, not having such a rigid way of displaying these messages is, is the best way to go about it for, for my work. Um, for example, the current micro series that I have is photography, but uh, currently I'm exploring whether or not another medium does convey that better. If another medium does allow me personally to learn more uh, about these images that I've already taken. So I'm using watercolor and wash, you know, different kinds of paint to see what, how that changes what has already been photographed. Um, and then I also have uh, installations where I have combined video art and sound art and uh, sculpture and used those things uh, together to convey a certain message. And that ties into a question I was actually sent uh, as well um, about one of my in installations and its specific goal. Um, so I feel like I can kind of mush these two together. Um, in that specific installation, I use, uh, I was describing plastic and the plastic crisis that we currently see in our oceans uh, using sculpture, uh, found objects, mostly including my own personal plastic trash, and then using found video footage and uh, projecting that through it to convey this message of desperation, uh, trying to encourage people by showing things that aren't necessarily pretty uh, or fun to look at. You know, they are very harsh images, um, but trying to convey the sense of urgency that is necessary to uh, create this kind of change uh, and help that you know, these animals do need because of you know, our own plastic use. Great. And then for um, Dwayne, there's a question that is, I think, kind of ties in with exactly what you were just talking about in terms of um, not really having a baseline from the past to compare to. And so kind of being confused about what is normal and what's good for the environment, what's changing it uh, in a negative way. And the question is, one of the most common interactions an everyday person has with organisms is lawn care. And so what is mowing gr our grass in this discussion? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, our most, uh, you could say our most abundant crop in the United States is grass. Not just any grass, it's the lawn in your property. So of course it has a huge impact on life in general. I mean, for that matter, it has a huge impact on the biosphere. So what can we do? I think there's a few things. I think that at some level, it's unrealistic to expect people to eliminate entirely having lawns. Um, there's a big investment made in a home and its value and all of that. But there are ways that we can increase its value to biodiversity. Some of those include uh, either reducing or limiting the kinds of herbicides and pesticides that are used. Eliminating them entirely, of course, would be on one end of it. The other end would be just eliminating use of certain really harmful ones. You've probably heard in the news things about neonicotinoid insecticides. 
These are extremely toxic. That is, they're toxic at very low quantity in the environment. They don't tend to be used in uh, settings around the home, although they can be. There are some other things that are used on lawns, like some of the chemicals used to reduce uh, weed growth in the spring that are highly toxic to amphibians. Uh, or, or better put, they cause uh, all sorts of developmental and other uh, hormone-mediated kinds of responses that are problematic. So, you know, on one hand, it's helpful to know a little bit about all this, but on the other, I think it's just a simple question to ask when lawns be, are being treated if they're, are, if they're aware of some of the ways they can mitigate impacts. More generally, it's great to have areas on a property that are not mowed. Obviously, when you have flowers and so on, that's helpful to biodiversity. But in the end, lawns are, are a problem for us, and they tend to be monocultures or nearly where you only have one or a few species growing. Um, but even so, there can be a lot there. The last thing I'd mention that's worth considering, it's become rather sort of popular in recent years to have your property, maybe not so much your lawn, but your property treated for mosquitoes. And, you know, as an entomologist uh, and a biologist who studies things sort of related to this, I can tell you, you're killing everything. So if you want to kill mosquitoes on your property by using insecticide, you're killing everything. It's sort of be like, you know, if you owned a forest and you didn't want rats in your forest, you kill everything. The birds, the foxes, the squirrels, the neighbor's cat, for that matter, if they come into contact. The reality is you're killing everything. So, you know, when it comes to things like mosquito control, there are ways to do it. There are, for example, as you're maybe aware, CO2 attractors and things like that, which are more specific to uh, pests like those. So I don't want to go on and on, but what I sh should simply say is that lawns themselves are not terrible. Uh, there are a fair bit of biodiversity that can reside in them, but there are definitely ways to make them friendlier to it. And mowing itself is not inherently harmful, um, but it is useful to have some flowering plants present that allow pollinators and other things to find nectar sources and maintain populations. There are things like food deserts that we use in conversation talking about humans, places where it's hard to find a grocery store, for example, uh, without driving a great distance. Well, the very same thing applies to insects. If there's nowhere to find nectar, you're not going to find bees. If there's nowhere to find pollen, you're not going to find insects that collect it and use it. And you'd be amazed the diversity of organisms, even beyond insects, that do these things. All right. And that was, I think, a good um, transition to this final um, comment that we have in the chat. Um, it's technically not a question, but I think it could promote some pretty good discussion. So it's um, kind of going back to when y'all were talking about science dealing with facts and art kind of coming from emotion. And it says the place of, or the place of interaction is between emotion and facts when it comes to communicating with people who are neither artists nor scientists, but who are vulnerable and moved by both. So to kind of make that a question to talk about, um, how do y'all think artists and biologists or just scientists in general can work together to kind of create that middle ground between fact and emotion to kind of capture people's attention and also keep it understandable so that they'll want to know more and want to find out more information? Uh, personally, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, using kind of a little bit of both uh, you know, artists using their skills to illustrate uh, the ideas that are coming from the scientists and to connect it to other art. Uh, it makes me think of, uh, for example, posters from groups like the Gorilla Girls who would combine not necessarily illustrations, but still images, uh, combined images, with these facts and these statistics that if you just looked at them, you would be like, ah, okay, like, cool. Um, but the power of the image creates, you know, it ties you to it, and it, it has its own conversation within this poster that is created. Uh, so I think there's definitely a way that artists and scientists can collaborate in 
a way that does bring people in to the conversation. Yeah, let me let me just interject as well. I mean, as much as science is sort of, um, I guess, in some ways, traditionally operated separate from emotion, or, or at least it, it seems as though that's sort of the, the MO, it's hard not to be emotional at some level. I mean, so many sort of components of our lives are impacted by what's happening, that if one isn't emotional about what's happening, and for that matter, considers the emotional component when conveying it, I think we're missing the reality of it. You know, we, we can't talk about uh, biodiversity, biodiversity lost, uh, or loss, and all these other changes simply in the context of how it's going to impact economies or how it's going to impact our in ability, if you will, to appreciate things that are around us. It's a lot more than that. I mean, if we even look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals, there's, you know, the, the sort of being modified as we go, but there's like 18 of them. And if you look at them, all but three are significantly negatively impacted by the loss of biodiversity. And you could argue that the others are as well if you take a little looser view of what they are. I mean, so this is, you know, a huge and impactful change that we are experiencing. It is unique. It's never happened in this way in the past. And at the very moment that we are alive, we're in the remarkable position of being able to do something about it. Because isn't it cool that there's challenges facing us that we actually know what to do about? It's a simple reality that we're choosing not to. And that's not something I think to take lightly because of course the future looking back at us in the past will vilify us for the decisions that we've made or those things we've chosen not to do. I don't argue it's easy um, and even that I know exactly how to do it but I would argue we know largely what to do. Um, the other minor point that I would make that's related to that is there's a lot of very emotional and very close held sorts of things that are again very relevant. You know, our personal health has been impacted. You know, when we talk about biodiversity, we're talking about really the biosphere around us, the quality of air and water and food that we eat. And so all of that has and will continue to negatively impact our health. So whether it's fertility rates, which are on the decline, nutrition and access to it, the simple truth is, in many, in many sort of statistics that we measure about the quality of the environment around us, it's rapidly being reduced. The quality of fresh water that's accessible to most people is being reduced. These all have an impact on our health. And how we can't be emotional about that, I don't know, uh, even if science likes to try to do that. Um, I do think, though, that that's an opportunity as well. I think that for scientists, we need to re sort of remind people that this isn't just some, you know, ivory tower of information that we want to share. This is simple, important, practical information that's relevant to all of us in our quality of lives and, for that matter, the future as we move forward. Um, so whether on topic or exactly or not here, I just wanted to, to make that point. It's too easy, I think, to get caught up that we can set this aside because it's only an emotional argument. It's not. On the other hand, it's not just a scientific one either. Um, it is very clearly at the interface between what it means to be human and, for that matter, to live on this planet, simply put. And we, we practically and, and rapidly need to do something about it. Okay, that was a great response. Um, so we're coming to the close of our talk and I have really enjoyed um, listening to both of you talk about all of the topics you've discussed so far. But before we end, I kind of want to give you all a little bit of time to let everyone know where can we find out more about you and the things that you all are working on and see some of the work that you've done. Kat, you go ahead. <laughs> uh, so I am on social media. Uh, my... I, I can put it in the chat if anyone is looking. Um, I'll put my art Instagram. I will also put my website uh, where I am uploading uh, the work that I'm doing. Uh, and that will be updated as I go. And as new projects come along, they'll definitely be on the website. Uh, did I miss anything? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's, that's all I got. I'll put it in the chat. 
Great. Uh, just two quick things that I'll share. Um, I, I'm not sure you want to hear more about what I do. Um, you could probably find that by Googling online. But what I do want you to be aware of is, is there's some, one of the neat things is there's some great information becoming available. Information about where we stand at the moment when it comes to the diversity of life on this planet, what we know, what we don't know, and the trajectories that different groups of organisms are on. So if you want to learn about that, uh, there is a lot of information on the website for, it's a terrible long name, it's IPBES. So this is the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPBES. It's a UN program. It's now been, in terms of how it came together, it's had thousands of scientists weigh in on it. It is, if you will, the state of the art of our current knowledge of life on this planet. It highlights the extraordinary things we don't know. There's a lot of that. But it also highlights what we do know. And uh, simply put, 25% of life on this planet in the next 50 years is almost certain to disappear. And that's in large part because almost that much already has. Um, and, and there's just no good story uh, to be told about the path we're on. But there's good science behind the information presented. That website does a great job. The first report came out in May of last year. Uh, globally, before that, there were regional reports. So I love to push people there because it's good science. And it's, it's the information. It's not, you know, rosy or, or politically oriented. It, I think it's pretty good info. So I would look there. Um, and uh, as I said, um, at the University of Memphis, I'm in charge of this group called or, or, I um, founded this group called the Center for Biodiversity Research, and I've enjoyed interacting with people like Kat 